My name is Helen, I'm from Carto. My claim to fame at this conference is I made the Taylor Swift map that Hattori showed at the keynote earlier. And we are going to be talking to you today about the future of uh, careers and skills in spatial data science. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce my panel. And as a little icebreaker, I'd like to ask them to tell us how they got into geospatial. So Abby, let's start with you. Great, I'll give a quick intro first. Hi everyone, I'm Ali Rossi. I'm a senior data scientist and tech lead at Foursquare, which is a geospatial platform. Um, and I work more specifically around analytics and insights. So taking our mobile um, location data, aggregating it in cool ways to um, get some good insights for advertisers, financial firms, et cetera. Um, so I'll say I actually, I guess, kind of fell into geospatial. I think that happens to a lot of people. I also only, uh, not only, but just moved into data science four years ago. Um, prior to that, I was working in data products, but on the client service side and then product management, um, and then took a role at Foursquare, and that's when I kind of got involved in geospatial and just learned so much on the job and really fell in love with it. Awesome, thank you. And Jade? Hi everyone, my name is Jade Fawcett and I am a GIS specialist at the University of Manchester in the UK. Um, I got into this career um, by studying geography at university and I loved GIS. Um, so yeah, I got my first job in GIS and have been there ever since. Awesome, and last but not least, Ray. Hi, Ray Roberts York, uh, Managing Director CEO of MBI. Michael Bauer International is based in Germany. Uh, pretty much got into the geo and data business by accident. Uh, 25, 26 odd years ago, started sourcing and looking for new data sets uh, and slowly but surely realized there was a need and developed on that and started aggregating, collecting data. So pretty much more the fascination of data got me into it, yeah. Awesome, I feel a theme already that everyone sort of got into geospatial by accident, which is awesome. Um, so I just want to start by sort of framing the conversation that we're going to have. One of my favorite quotes that I've heard in the last few years is actually the Harvard Business Review said that the data scientist was going to be the sexiest job of the 21st century. So I hope you've all got that in your Tinder profiles. Um, but actually, I think a lot of us tend to struggle with recruitment and finding the right talent and the right fits for our business needs, and I sort of want to dig into that a bit in our panel. So actually at Carto, every couple of years, we run a survey called the State of Spatial Data Science. Some of you might even have participated in that. And at our last survey, which was at the start of this year, we found that around 80% of respondents were saying they find it either difficult or very difficult to recruit people and find the right talent for, for their roles. So that's what we're sort of gonna be digging into with this panel. I mean, I'll sort of kick it off by saying, do those stats surprise you? We won't, we won't touch on the sexiest uh, job. That's the sort of topic for another panel, but 82% of people struggling to find the right talent. Does that surprise you? Ray, maybe we'll kick off with you. I'll be honest, we, we, we're fortunate not to have the challenge, okay? So we, we actually have a waiting list. Um, so obviously not for all the roles. But we have a waiting list. We have more a problem trying to find out which one of these do we take. Okay, so so that's a happy problem. So uh, obviously, I think there are certain companies. Some of our partners are looking for people, and they struggle to find people. But we're very fortunate that we do not have that problem yet. Yeah. That's what, I mean, is there anything that you think that you're doing, or is it maybe your geography because you're based in Germany, I believe? I think it's pretty much because. The way that we structure, the, the, the way we employ people, uh, we give them the responsibility. Uh, most of our staff bring friends, bring other colleagues from other companies and bring them along and say, look, this is amazing to work. Yeah, we, we want you to join. And, and that's pretty much been it. So it hasn't been a question that we have to go out and say, look, we're looking for people. It's more a question of they'll say, come, hey, you've got to work for us. Uh, it's a really great company. They look after the staff. They do, do well. Uh, and that's important. I think that encourages it more. Mm. It makes it far easier as well, because then the team's also working with people they like. Definitely. Yeah, you know, so, you know, you're trying to integrate externals into them. So that has been our advantage. Awesome. I'm sure lots of people will be picking your brains at the after party of what you're doing to attract such fantastic talent. Oh, really? I mean, Jade, Ali, how um, do those sort of things ring true to you? Do you have similar experiences, or are you struggling more to find the talent that you're looking for? Um, in my experience, it's, um, it really varies depending on the level, but 
in our sort of more junior recruitment, um, we tend to look for more sort of general skills. And if that individual has got the passion, the energy, the enthusiasm for learning, um, then it's not too much of a challenge. But um, yeah, maybe the more senior um, you go, I would say so. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely reflect what you're saying, Jade. Um, I think at Foursquare, a lot of people have come in not with those geospatial skill sets, but you sort of learn on the job. Um, we also, we have a really great geospatial tool that makes it very easy, so that's how I started to get more involved in, in geospatial, and we train up analysts on it. Um, I do think, though, that just data science in general and hiring analysts as well can be difficult. I do see a lot of companies that they want that perfect skill set. They want 100% of a list that they put together of every, every single you know, background item that someone may need. And you know, for me personally, I moved to data science. I would probably say my skill set was a little more rudimentary than it should have been, um, but I moved internally and the company took a chance on me. And you know, with that experience and other people I've seen that we've sort of developed, I think um, you know, giving people a chance is a really good thing to do, but how do you go through a pool of applicants and see like, who would be someone great to grow? Um, so I think that, that can be difficult. Companies can struggle with that, and that's why they say, no, we need the safe candidate that meets 100% of the criteria. So I think, like Jade said, looking for passion, looking for people who are interested. I think smart people can learn anything, so if you find someone who has you know, a, a good basis and that passion and interest, I think um, more companies should think about going for those types of candidates. Yeah, I think that um, that's something a lot of people see. I think when you look at job adverts in the geospatial world, they're about sort of four pages long, and that's longer than your resume. <laughs> the sort of uh, all the boxes you have to tick sometimes doesn't feel necessarily fair, particularly at entry level. So I think those softer skills that you're looking for, particularly passion and um, a sort of desire to learn, is so important. Our industry changes so quickly that being committed to keeping up with those changes is really important. But I, I just want to touch on something that you mentioned uh, in there, Ali, which was about how lots of people in your organization tend to come from a data science background or a data analysis background rather than necessarily a GIS or geography background, which I believe is your background. Uh, Jade, it's also my background. Um, and it sort of brings me to the point of, I think we've all probably been uh, guilty in the room of using the phrase spatial is special in the past, which is one of my favorite phrases. But in terms of skill sets and careers, is that something you think is true? Do you think people need to have a really solid background in GIS and geography and spatial analysis? Or is that sort of data, um, yeah, that more data or statistics background more important? Or do you think maybe both are necessary in having sort of different, different skill sets is what makes a company uh, better? Ray, you're stroking your chin, which yeah. means you have a thought. <laughs> no, I, I think it's, it's important. I mean, we do it the same. If we look at people, we look at the person and not the qualification. Okay, because if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and, and, and we do find most of the people that we have in the company do come from other jobs, special entities. But I think it's more a question of inspiring the people to be creative, because what we do in spatial and geo, we are, we are creating the future. We're using this to do sustainability, to plan, to do any expansions, to do all these type of things. So we need to encourage the people that this is exciting, this is great stuff, this is rocket science. Yeah? Uh, but it's not impossible for anybody to do, and by inspiring the people, and that gains the interest, and when you have interest, obviously you learn. And, and then you get them going. And then quickly they develop into, into different directions, but that's the way you do it. Uh, obviously, when you, when you think about any student today who goes studying, um, you're young, you don't know what you want to study. You do, do geography, you do whatever. And only afterwards you really realize, where's my passion? Uh, I think the, the, the university and the degrees is important because it shows that there's a capability to take on a task and complete it. But one shouldn't be measured on that. Okay, on that what the task was, more the, the capability. And then if there's an interest, there's always a way. So we do have quite a few people which have the diplomas in, the, in, in GIS, in, in uh, geography, and so forth, but we also have people that have none. 
uh, and that have worked their way up in the company and process data and do all the same work as the others. But they just, I mean, one, one that we have, he was a um, car spray painter. <laughs> okay, and today he works in GIS, uh, cutting data, delivering data, doing all that type of thing. So it's possible for anybody. And, and when he did his first apprenticeship, he never in his life thought he'd be working in an office. <laughs> and today you can't imagine working anywhere else. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah, I think for me, from the, from the employer's perspective as well, it could depend on um, the size of the organisation. So before I was at Manchester Uni, um, working for like a global engineering consultancy, it was so big that we could have people from all different backgrounds and different experiences and together we'd make this team that seemed to work, but then maybe a smaller organization, they would need to look for those specific combined skill sets. But I agree with what you said, right, in terms of for students, um, just do what you enjoy and yeah, Growing. go with that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think um, something that I'm taking away from what all of you are saying is that those soft skills are and almost qualities that a person has are as much, if not more important than the technical skills. But this might not be a question that we can answer now, but how do you find those soft skills when often the first stage of an application process is to send a resume or CV as we call them in the UK, and you're maybe receiving 300 of those and applying for jobs is just getting easier with AI and ChatGPT that I'm expecting that to go up. Um, that's more of a rhetorical question, unless any of you do have a thought <laughs> on that. Yeah, I think it comes out in a, face, in a more face-to-face -face or Zoom type of interview. You know, communication skills are so important for a data scientist. We often don't think about those. We often don't, you know, work on developing those. That's why anytime there's a speaking opportunity, I say, yes, I'll do it, because each one has helped me grow more and more in that. Um, but in, in an interview, if you ask, you know, a candidate to tell you about a project and you probe them with some questions and you ask them, how did this come about? What was the use case, you know? what were the results, and if they can tell a nice cohesive story, that's, that's a good way of seeing, like, okay, this person can work cross-functionally, as many data scientists have to, or will be able to talk to customers, as well as having the technical skills that you'll see on the resume or in, like, a technical screen. Definitely, and I, I always really like the question in interviews, and what did you learn from that, and what would you do better? I think in interviews, we're all probably guilty of trying to present what we've done as being absolutely perfect, but seeing that sort of thirst for learning um, is really fantastic. Um, so I'd like to, I'm conscious of time, so I'd like to move on a little bit from hiring to retention, um, which I don't think was in the description for this talk, but when we were prepping this panel, stop flipping your hair, um, when we were prepping this panel, we thought it was something just as important to talk about, because I think a lot of organisations do struggle with retaining that top talent. Um, is that something that you, you've encountered in your, in your careers? Any, um, Ray shaking his head again. <laughs> Like your company is a HR dream. Um, so, is there anything you've seen? I mean, maybe we'll start with you then. Is there anything that you think you're doing particularly to retain that top talent? Yeah, well, I mean, for us in the company, we've got a policy we put the staff first. Okay, and that is priority number one. So, the customer, everything else comes after that because if the staff and the team are in harmony with each other and confident that we have each other's backs, we can do everything. We'll get those customers, we'll get the money, we'll get all everything, but they first. And, and, and that we really live by. Um, and, and going back to, to hiring, if you have a good team and you rely on your team, you trust them and you say, look, we're looking for somebody. They are more eager to bring in friends and, and, and other colleagues from previous jobs and they'll bring them in because they can reference that. And then you can build because that saves you already half the search. And then it's a question of you already know that they can mix into the group. I mean, when we had the, the COVID pandemic, we had this home office, which just dropped everything. I never thought we'd ever go into home office, and then everybody was gone. I was the only guy in the office. Uh, and then slowly but surely, the guys came back. Now we have a two-day week that the people should come into the office, because we've realized things have changed. The people have evolved. They all have dogs. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we changed the policy. In our company, you can bring your dog to work. Okay, so we We've have up to six, seven dogs running about bringing dogs to work. <laughs> <laughs> so no one's bought his goldfish yet. <laughs> so, uh, is it, whose mic's going? I flipped my hair. <laughs> one sit perfectly still. Okay, I've got no idea. We've got some backlash here. No one's telling us off. Maybe we'll just continue. <laughs> okay. So, 
it's, it's about looking after stuff and making sure that it's important how we can make their lives easy. So we let them bring their dogs. Uh, we select the days accordingly. So some people come in on the Mondays and the Fridays, the others take the middle of the week. And just being there for your staff, that helps keep people happy. Because if you keep your staff happy, the rest is easy. Mm. Yeah, that, that company culture, that mythical company culture is so important. But something else I want to talk about as well is more career paths. I know something we've discussed, we all come from a sort of more corporate, maybe consultancy-based background. Jade, I know you, we, you and I come from very similar consultancy backgrounds. And something that I think a lot of people struggle with in their sort of mid to late stage careers is feeling like they maybe have to give up being so hands-on on the data and have to go down a more managerial path, whether that is managing people, managing projects, managing budget or software. I, th I think that's something both of you have experience with. Jade, do you want to maybe kick yeah. us off with your um, thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I would say that it's important for managers or leadership to understand your employees' key values and what motivates them, what demotivates them, um, and then work from there. It, it might be hard, again, in a smaller company, um, but if someone wants to be 100% technical, like maybe look at um, one day a week of non-technical, for example. Um, but the other key one for me is um, having role models. Um, especially women, um, so there's like a saying, you've got to see it to believe it, so as you move up the ladder, um, seeing other women in tech um, higher up is, is great. Yeah, I completely agree to, to echo Jade's point. Um, I, I think, and going back to the retention point, I think offering career growth and showing how important diversity is. So if you if you show that um, you're going to just hire senior technical employees from outside and they're all going to not be diverse, then people see that and they think, OK, well, I have no path to grow and I don't have role models. So like, do I do I even belong here? So I think that's that's super important um, to keep your employees happy and have them see a future at your company. And I think what Jade mentioned also about what motivates your employees. Are they interested in working more with clients? Do they want to stay on the technical path? And you know, personally, I moved over from product to data science. I worked really hard to do that. It was not easy. I had to have some luck, too. And now I'm working on getting a master's in computer science to really like up my skill set. And I'm, I'm dedicated to being a technical employee being a tech lead. Um, but last year I was asked, hey, like we need someone to manage this team. You know, are you interested? And I thought, oh gosh, I have to take this opportunity, right? This is how you do career growth. And I was like, oh, there goes my amazing IC <laughs> career. I was happy for about two years, you know? Um, and then I, I talked to some people who advised me in my career and I thought about it more. And I said, I want to be a tech lead. I don't want to be a manager. I would have stayed in product if I wanted to manage people. It's just not what I want to spend my time on. So I actually you know, spoke with my manager and said, is there another path? And we were able to eke out like a tech lead role for me where I would do a lot of the project assignment and mentorship and working with stakeholders, but I wasn't going to be managing. So we were able to kind of meet the business need, but give me what I wanted. So I think um, it's a good example of, of, uh, of that. I'm definitely really taking away from what all you're saying that it's so important to find what you're passionate about, whether that is spatial data science or more, I don't know, data visualization or development, find what you're passionate about and then try and carve out a career path for yourself around that rather than pursuing career growth for the sake of career growth. Would you, would you agree that that's, that's something you all think is important? Definitely. I think in every job there's, there's things that people don't like doing. I got to pile of those. Uh, but there's things that I'm passionate about and that keeps me, gets me excited. It makes me wake up five in the morning and I can't wait to do things. And it's those other things that come in between. But that we all have. Uh, but the, the challenges or the, the, the things, bring the excitement in. And, and you mentioned it as well. Get your management involved with the people. Mm. Okay, mm. and then you develop your people into those roles and you get them doing the things that they do good. Obviously, we can't all do all the lovely things. There's some people that do <laughs> the others. But there's people that like doing those things and yes. find those people and put them into those roles. Mm. And, and that grows. Uh, that has immense power. I mean, and th that's very important. I mean, you're so happy in your job now, nobody can steal you away. Uh, and, and that's important. 
And that value for your, your, your company is amazing. So someone could come here and say, look, you're going to get a brand new BMW, and you're going to get this, and you're going to, and you go, look, I'm happy. Now that is quality. Uh, and, and, and that's where people get it wrong, and they look at the numbers, they forget about the people. Uh, he's off sick. He's got a problem. Why is he off sick? Find out, you know, does he have a sick child, a sick mother? Look into mm. the situation. Find a way to resolve it or support them in that. Stay at home. Work from home. You know, until this resolve. That person will never leave you. Mm. Treating people as people, not Looking numbers. Looking at the person for who mm. they are. That is what's important. Okay. And the rest comes. Obviously, you can't be the office cleaner and work from home office. That wouldn't work. Uh, <laughs> but find something that works. Definitely. So I'm conscious of time. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I just want to, before we throw out questions, I just want to touch on one point that I know is important to all of us who are on the panel, which is diversity and inclusion, particularly of gender. So I think like it's no secret to anyone that spatial data science is a very male-dominated industry. I'm really pleased that on this stage that is not necessarily true, but thank you, Ray, for keeping representation <laughs> of the men folk. But um, is, there, is there any sort of advice you would give to organizations or individuals trying to encourage more women or people from other underrepresented backgrounds into the spatial data science industry? I mean, JG mentioned the importance of having role models, but is there, is there anything else that comes to mind to try and, yeah, better have a more representative community? Yeah, definitely. So I think um, it starts at the job advertisement. So there's now online tools that you can run your um, job at uh, advertisements through to check the language, if it's more geared towards men, more geared towards women, or if it's neutral. Um, you can also, um, in things like, uh, as part of the interview process, provide information on things like maternity cover and share a contact in HR who the potential employee could speak to. Um, because, yeah, I think sometimes it's, it's too late if the employer doesn't tell the individual until after they've been offered the job. Um, and then a final one, sorry, is um, try and have diverse representation on the panels. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Diverse representation on the panels, but also in your company, in senior yeah. leadership. Um, and it, it's interesting, like, our company has, has done some of the things that you mentioned, like running, um, you know, through uh, to see how the language looks. Um, another thing that um, our employee resource group for women in tech, we kind of fought for last year was women often look at the list of skills needed and they say, oh, I don't have all of those, so I'm not going to apply. And they've done studies that men will say, oh, I have 50%, I'm going to apply, which is great. I encourage that. But they've, um, Foursquare has now put a little you know, disclaimer down there saying, hey, if you don't have all of these um, skills, still apply. Like We welcome people from you know, different backgrounds and experiences. So I, I think things like that, based on, on research and, and data, can be really helpful. Definitely. We do the exact same thing at Carto, and I think sometimes someone might have some skills that you never would have thought of were really useful for your company. But when you start talking to them, interviewing them, you're like, Fantastic, that's something we never even realized we knew we needed until we spoke to you. Um, brilliant, oh, I see we have one minute, 30 seconds left. I'd love to be able to open this out uh, for some questions because it's a really important topic. So um, does anyone have a question? Or is everyone tired after lunch? Oh, we have a question here in the middle. Run, Matt. <laughs> I haven't seen Matt running around like a gazelle, amazing. <laughs> Um, are there any particular skills or experiences that, um, if you see in a resume, a, a candidate's resume or profile, that tends to stick out for you? Any particular skills that a candidate has that would really stick out for you or really resonate if you looked on a CV? I mean, for me, um, less skills and more, because um, I'm all about communication, I guess, coming from the business side of the company. Um, I also look for, like, if they mention their projects either you know, personal projects or at work, talking, like, talking about it in a business sense. So this was done for this reason, and these were the results you know, with some numbers there. I feel like that 
you can see a list of, of skills that might be necessary for the job. You know, you're, you know Python, you know this and that. But if you're also able to see that connection to that business side, that kind of indicates what we were talking about. Yeah, with the soft skills, they may have an understanding and, and care to be able to dig into requirements and use cases and customer need like when they're working in the role. Mm. I guess it's that difference between saying, I automated this process with Python, and I automated this process with Python, saving my company X amount of money or generating new projects or something like that. Any, anything from either of you on that question? Uh, Any skills that really resonate when you look at a CV? I'd say in, in the interview, maybe curiosity and evidence of like a wider knowledge of what's going on in the spatial data science world. Um, not looking for you, you, for you to have knowledge of everything, but maybe an awareness of some of the key trends, news of, uh, yeah. So, like yeah. coming to the Spatial Data Science Conference. <laughs> and Ray, anything for you? It depends what role you're filling. Mm. I mean, I got some developers, if you look at them, you go, can you speak? Because they do not communicate, so you're not going to get anything out of them, so they'll just sit there and look at you. Yeah. Um, so it's a question of finding out what do they do, and it's like you say, staying up to date, finding out what's new. If you see that the interest is there, learning the new languages, understanding these things, that's important. The interest. If it's there, you can grow the interest. Yeah. Great. Okay, I believe, thank you for those answers, they're fantastic. I believe we're out of time, so we can't take any more questions, but I believe you're going to be around for the rest of the day and at the after party. Excellent. So they will be there if you want to grill them on any of this. So please join me in giving a round of applause for our fantastic panel on spatial science careers.